Thanks. Um, so Smod, did you get a chance to read uh, the paper Brian, uh, Brian sent you? No, I, I, it's uh, pretty extensive. I didn't get a chance to read it, but I read parts of it and I read the conclusion. And um, yeah, it's interesting. I think the, the overall proposal is to um, do, um, to have a kind of an evidence network, I think, um, rather than a hierarchy where, um, you know, I, I guess, I, th I think what he's trying to get at is that, you know, all evidence should be considered and, and depending on how well uh, designed studies are and, and how uh, rigorous they, they are, um, you know, they should all be in some ways equally respected or it shouldn't be, a, uh, there shouldn't be a system where one study automatically outweighs another just because it has a, you know, it's higher in the hierarchy. So that's that's one thing I pulled away from it, but there's lots more points I didn't get to. Did, did you read it? Yeah. What's your thoughts on it? Well, one one I don't know for just I don't know for reading the same one, but uh, just to make sure, um, one of the interesting points was that uh, we would use uh, in different uh, types of science we'd use different types of he uh, evidence hierarchies, and I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, my friend up there kind of agreed too. Yeah, um, I mean, different evidence hierarchies, but okay, I, I, I'm only really talking about medicine here. Okay. Uh, I mean, yeah, in, in other, in other, if you're talking about totally different fields, then I, I, um, I'll defer to other experts in, in those fields, because I'm not an expert in those fields. But in medicine, I mean, if you look at any evidence hierarchy, they're, they're all roughly constructed the same way. Uh, I mean, there's, you know, little nuances here and there, like, where like systemic review is that above meta analysis or meta analysis is higher, and then uh, you know cohort versus case control and all that kind of stuff is that is one higher than the other. You know, there's all these kinds of subtle differences, um, but but by and large, a meta analysis will always be above expert opinion or 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 you know mechanism is oftentimes not even on the hierarchy, so. Uh, you know, that's what I meant by like. There's, it's not like my hierarchy. It's, it's, it's commonly accepted hierarchy in medicine, and there's, there is research behind it. I think somebody mentioned that uh, the whole hierarchy is, is just based on expert opinion, so uh, it doesn't have any grounding or foundation. But uh, what, what I would counter with is that it's really based on logic, right? So if you have a study that is uh, and then the week I kind of talked about this with the with the art discussion, but um, if you have a study that's very well powered that has you know tens of thousands of people versus uh, you know a study with far less people, then obviously the power will be more representative of reality, right? That's just common sense. It's just logic, and then also the variability, right? So if you have different kinds of studies uh, that are all uh, amalgamated and then put through analysis, um, you're, you're making things more generalizable. So when they are more generalizable, they're more likely to reflect reality and the variability of, of people, right? So that is, so my argument would be that the evidence hierarchy is, is really accepted based on, on logic, on principles of logic and stati statistical logic uh, rather than uh, expert opinion. For me, I guess it depends on my level of epistemic confidence in the first place. For for instance, if I'm completely unfamiliar with a field, uh, you could give me one study which kind of points in a certain direction, but um, I should probably prioritize kind of meta-analyses and more and broader um, meta-studies in that sense, because there's always going to be a single study that points a certain direction. It's, it's about really the weight of evidence. So in that sense, like... I, like if my um, level of epistemic certainty in the field in general or in the position is fairly low, I should probably prioritize certain things over others and kind of adopt a hierarchy in that way. Uh, and to be a good Bayesian reason, it requires that I update my confidence uh, relative to the evidence itself. I guess I wouldn't, if what you're saying is we should always kind of prioritize a certain kind of study over another, I, I would agree with you that that doesn't seem reasonable. Um, but 
but then if you're going to say depending on the study design we should kind of value the outcomes of certain studies more than others that to me is very hierarchical and, and it makes a lot of sense uh yeah one second one second Uh, yeah, I, I agree with everything you said. Uh, it, let, let me just uh, add a caveat to everything I just said. So just because somebody has an evidence hierarchy in medicine doesn't mean that a, a study that's higher in the hierarchy uh, automatically out, uh, makes invalidates uh, research that's lower in the hierarchy. So when you're looking at actual individual studies and individual research, you have to look at that actual study. You have to look at uh, you know, was it well constructed? Did, did the statistical analysis make sense? Did it, uh, you know, did it, uh, you know, did it, uh, the peer reviewers, were they, you know, you, you consider bias, I mean, bias doesn't invalidate a study, but, you know, consider bias, like, you, you have to fully analyze a study. And it's very possible that uh, a systemic, uh, systematic review, or a meta analysis could be, you know, not reflective of reality at all because of poor design, right? And and one example of that is um, a study that's often referenced by uh, people who deny cholesterol as being a, uh, you know, being a contributing factor in heart disease by that guy. I, I forgot his name. Uh, Yuli Rubinskoff. Uh, sorry, Rubinskoff. Uh, something like that, right? So, so, so maybe that might be it. His, I think his first name is Yuli or U-L-L-E or something like that. And he, he writes a lot of books about how uh, class, class, there, there's a big um, hoax or it, it's, it's all uh, a lie about cholesterol causing heart disease and that all the, the entire medical establishment is wrong. Um, but anyways, uh, so he did a, a review that's published. And uh, of course, it's extremely poor, poorly uh, written and has lots of conjecture in it and, and opinions. Um, so that would not outrank uh, a well-designed randomized control trial that it was uh, sufficiently powered. So, yeah, just because something is higher in the hierarchy doesn't mean that it uh, necessarily uh, uh, is more. It doesn't mean it's more valid than something lower in the hierarchy. Uh, the hierarchy is just a general framework. For which you kind of think about think about evidence and think about you know when, when you're kind of investigating uh, what, whatever it is a treatment or a risk factor or whatever it is, uh, but then you still have to look at the individual study. So I, I don't know if uh, what Rudolph if that makes sense or not. Well, I'm just asking for a clarification. Um, so it doesn't sound to me like you're arguing against having an evidence hierarchy or a hierarchy even of studies, but rather you're against a very particular kind of hierarchy. So what would that hierarchy be? I, I haven't read the paper that um, you guys were talking about. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, so yeah, I, I, I do believe in having a general hierarchy or general framework. I think that's helpful uh, in scientific discourse and endeavor. Um, w what I'm against is when people say that uh, things like expert opinion, anecdotal evidence, mechanistic data uh, supersedes uh, things like meta-analysis. So, so when you're really at the total, totally bottom of the pile when it when it comes to the hierarchy, um, and then you're essentially pulling things out of the bottom and saying this is more valid than your meta-analysis of of two million person years or what what you know a very strong, well-designed study, then I, I have an objection to that. That's my objection. Yeah, fair enough. I've, I've heard some, um, a few people criticize meta studies in general. I think um, they, they tend to see them as more speculative or uh, less able to be trusted than specific studies that are going to be very clear in what they're trying to do. Um, so I can see how that might play into a hierarchy. But I also like, as I was saying before, I think that these broader level studies are incredibly important for certain purposes. I mean, it's always about the question you're asking in particular, right? Uh, if the question I'm asking in particular is what should I be leaning towards without knowing a whole lot, I'm going to be looking at broader studies. If if I have kind of questions about uh, specific methodology for specific questions, then yeah, the individual, like, so the, there's never going to be a hierarchy that's kind of universal ever in anything. So yeah, I completely agree with what you're saying. Yeah, I, I think we're on the same page. I think I, I missed something at the start of what you said there. Um just the right the starting there what, what did you say again can you just repeat that uh can't quite remember 
Yeah, it, it, sorry, it, I, it'll come to me and then I'll, I'll mention it. But yeah, I mean, I think we're on the same page. I mean, <clears throat> in medicine, I, just to say that, that there is no agreed upon hierarchy, I, I think literally that's true. But if we relax our, our uh, aggression with, with uh, you know, the details, it, I think it's not true in the sense that if you look at the, the, you know, the majority of researchers and physicians and you, and you pose them, you know, generally what do you consider a, a good hierarchy of evidence in terms of, you know, analyzing a treatment or, or a risk factor, um, they're, they're going to come to some kind of framework uh, that's that's pretty pretty much universally agreed upon. Um, of course, there's going to be outliers. Of course, there's going to be people like you know the people that we've talked to in the past in this Discord who believe in mechanistic data out, outweighing um, uh, you know large scale meta analyses. But by and large, I think you're going to be hard pressed to find uh, that many um, physicians and and uh, PhD researchers. Uh, that will, you know, um, basically have a hierarchy that looks dr dramatically different than the one we've d discussed. So it literally, in the literal sense, yes, of course, everybody has subtle differences. Cohort should be here. Case control should be over here. Um, but, but I think more or less everything looks the same uh, in terms of the majority of researchers that, that would accept a, a hierarchy. Yeah, it's interesting that people would say that, would say that kind of mechanistic, uh, individual mechanistic studies outweigh meta studies, given that obviously they're kind of talking on, on two very different levels. So I, it, it seems confusing to me because if you're going to be kind of prioritizing individual and mechanistic studies, at some point you're going to have to weigh up a whole collection of them and use that as this kind of uh, to increase your epistemic weighting um, in a certain manner. And in that case, you're engaging in a meta study anyway, even if you're doing so informally, right. unless you just want to speak about the very individual level, which, you know, is fine. So yeah, right, it seems right. strange to have this universal hierarchy. No, absolutely. Like, for example, if I have a very specific clinical question that does, you know, is the Jack stat pathway involved in polycythemia? You know, that's a very specific mechanistic question. I'm not necessarily going to do a meta analysis of that, right? I'm going to be doing very focused, uh, specific in vitro and potentially in vivo research that's, that's, you know, much more focused. But if I have a more general question, uh, like does cholesterol cause heart disease, does um, X risk factor cause Y disease, then, then I would want a larger scale, more generalizable study uh, and that study is, you know, a well-powered randomized control trial, meta-analysis of randomized control trial, or, you know, other, you know, large uh, epidemiological studies, uh, case controls, uh, cohort studies, things like that. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think I think that's what you're getting at, which I totally agree with, that if, you're, if your study topic... Uh, is, is is more focal, then your your research will be more focal as well. Um, so anyways, um, I, I guess the the point of this discussion, we were we were talking about I was talking with I think I don't know how you say Uchi. I don't know how to say that if I'm saying it right. Yeah that's fine. Yeah Uchi. So yeah, what I was trying to get at with the um, with the study uh, study hierarchies and um, uh, you know the the people that we were talking about, I I'm just going forward, just just so you guys know, I'm gonna try not to mention people, mention names, or call people out, or you know that kind of thing. I because I just want everything to be very collegial and you know uh, you know not not uh, provocative, and I don't want it to be a big fight or whatever. But um, so. The thing that I was getting at was that with study hierarchies, I, I think I've already said it basically. So gen generally there's an agreed upon hierarchy that's roughly that's roughly something like, you know, expert opinion. Um, actually, let me let me just pull up a let, let me pull, but basically, yeah, expert opinion, uh, a cohort or a case control, then you have RCTs, then you have meta-analyses, 
and then you have like a system a systematic review of of many uh, different different studies. Uh, I I think that the review sometimes. Uh, it, to me, a review is below a meta-analysis because a review oftentimes doesn't have a lot of statistical rigor, um, but you know, more or less, they're in the same uh, ballpark. So that kind of general framework is generally accepted by the vast majority of medical researchers uh, and, and, and scientists. I've, obviously, you're going to have some outliers that have very bold claims that are completely divergent from, from the, uh, the pyramid there. Um, but that's kind of what's accepted. I don't think Garth is uh, accepting of anything that's dramatically different from that. For example, s stating that mechanistic data is, can, it potentially supersedes uh, well, well-designed meta-analyses. Like that, to me, is totally nonsensical. It, it, makes, it makes no sense. In fact, if a meta-analysis points to a certain points to a certain direction in terms of um, where where a conclusion lies, or or where the effect of a treatment or the effect of a risk factor on on a disease, uh, and that's divergent from the what the mechanistic data uh, um, indicates. And what that means to me is that we need to go back to the bench and back to the mechan mechanism and kind of reformulate it to explain the findings of the uh, larger scale studies, um, because the larger scale studies are showing. Uh, a, a clear connection between a risk factor and a disease or whatever the, the topic is. Uh, and so that supersedes um, any potential mechanistic speculative discussion uh, just because of, again, because of its statistical power uh, in, in, in generalizability, whereas a mechanism is, is really, really uh, basically hypothesis. That's what a mechanism is. Of course, there's mechanistic, stronger mechanistic data uh, that can, uh, for example, prove a certain signal transduction pathway works, you know, for example, or JAK, the JAK-STAT pathway does stimulate this, you know, protein kinase, and therefore it's related to polycythemia, or, you know what I mean? Th those those kinds of things are potentially true, but if your high-level study is pointing in a certain direction and it disagrees with your lower-level study, then oftentimes you need to go back to the mechanism and find out kind of where things went wrong. I, the analogy I like to make is like in physics where we do experiment, right? So experimental physicists, you have string theorists, you have all these guys. I wish there was a, a, a physicist in, in our Discord because it would be great to talk to him and get him to talk to um, Darth and stuff. But you have a, uh, a physicist with a certain theory. He puts forward the theory and people don't just simply take that at face value. To see if it comports with reality, they need to have um, a actual. Um, ex they need to have uh, evidence. They need to have experimental evidence uh, that that uh, c that agrees uh, with the with the theory. And the theory should it, it predict something that that uh, you know that we can see in nature. So it, that's the kind of analogy I make with medical research. So to what extent? Yeah, I'm not really familiar with medical research. To what extent would you say that um, meta-analyses like this tend to collate very similar kinds of studies, maybe studies that have similar questions or goals or they're looking for correlations, uh, very particular correlations that can be kind of generalized versus to what extent they're almost, um, I guess, translating individual studies into the broader questions? Because I think that that's where some of the problems can lie if we if we're kind of collecting a whole bunch of studies and um, which might have very subtly different uh, preconditions or questions or, or correlations and we're using them to ask the same question as opposed to kind of maybe a whole like I think minimum wage uh, metastasis might be a, a good example of that even though I'm not really familiar with that too but if if all these individual studies are kind of asking a similar question about will minimum wage will a higher minimum wage be better or worse et cetera, et cetera, um, then I think the meta study has more weight in that sense. But if there's a whole lot of kind of translation going on, that's when it becomes uh, a bit stranger because whatever statistical rigor exists, you have to still um, uh, categorize a whole bunch of um, evidence in one direction and in another direction. And that's where the problems could lie. I think that um, that's, that's a problem I often find in systematic reviews where 
they don't uh, they don't have the rigor. Uh, they don't have the st statistical rigor. Uh, in meta analyses that are well designed, there is a lot of rigor. And and I think everything you're talking about, Rudolph, comes down to whether or not the meta analysis was well designed. So well designed meta analysis is not only does it have you know good power, good statistical rigor, but it also basically has uh, oftentimes many different studies and oftentimes many, many different types of studies. So for, for example, let me get let me pull up this example because this is the example we used before, uh, the, the European Heart Journal meta analysis. And what was very strong about this study is that it used different types of studies. So it used Mendelian randomization studies, it used prospective um, uh, uh, epidemiologic studies, um, it used uh, inherited disorders from uh, lipid uh, metabolism, like it uses all these different forms of research and analyzed each of them and then kind of figured out what was the conclusion from the analysis of each subset of, of the different types of research. And if all the conclusions pointed into the same direction, uh, meaning uh, that uh, LDL is connected to um, atherosclero atherosclerosis, then that is a sign of, of strength of the opinion. Let me post the whole. Those are like super. Sorry, sorry, I sorry, uh, not strength of the opinion, strength of the uh, uh, hypothesis or invalidating the null hypothesis. Sorry, what did you say? I was also thinking about um, the other problem of maybe going way too broad. Like, I'm thinking of kind of you I knew this. Um, this is. You know how he had all this stuff like most medical research is wrong, all these really provocative claims. Um, you know about that, right? It, it just seems like a really, an incredibly broad, um, almost just pretty much opinion piece, uh, which isn't. It's it doesn't. It won't ever have the rigor that you need when you're asking kind of more specific questions. So I guess that could be the other problem. Is going too broad. Um. I don't, I don't see that as a, I mean, I, I guess if, if by broadness, you mean that it's not focused in answering the question of the study, then I think I agree that would be a problem. But if you mean broad in terms of a diversity of research that's included in the analysis, I don't think that's a problem. I think that's a strength. The more broad your research, the more diversity of research you have in the analysis, the more, the stronger your analysis is because it's more generalizable. Well, I'm specifically thinking about this one uh, thing. I this is like from the '90s or something. Um, Ioannidis, Ioannidis. Uh, why I think it's called why most published medical research is wrong. Have you heard of that particular study? That no. I'll try pull it up. So, so what can you mention? Can you summarize what the argument is? Like why? Why is most medical research, uh, published medical research, wrong? I don't believe that it is. Uh, this is the claim made in the paper. He he kind of um, I read it a while ago, so it's kind of very uh, vague to me. But he made a few arguments. Like there wasn't much statistical rigor that I remember. Uh, particularly like he made kind of uh, like these kind of neoliberal arguments about the motivations of research projects as funded by private institutions and. Uh, and chemical manufacturers and so on and um and there's obviously like replicability stuff like this kind of stuff has definitely been a problem in psychology which i'm more familiar with uh and like yeah if there's a kind of um a, an opinion piece saying psychology is a big problem and we need a, a replicability crisis and we need to kind of be aware of this and challenge it and there's been a few very interesting um individual studies that kind of point out one of them uh which i got from very bad wizards was they asked academic psychologists to make bets on uh I, I don't remember if it was which studies or just in general how often the studies would be replicated and when they were actually making bets they were very accurate as to the ratio of, of studies that will be replicated and, and which ones won't but when obviously when they're publishing themselves they're not uh they're giving themselves the benefit of the doubt or they're deliberately overlooking certain things in order to just publish I'm going to try to pull up this paper, though. Yeah, to me, that, that sounds like, uh, you know, potentially bias and um, just just poor design uh, that can be a factor. And you hope that caught uh, in the process of the peer review of the journal, uh, 
So that that's not a factor. Um, but yeah, that could be a problem for sure. But but so I guess anyway, the bottom line kind of point I'm trying to make is that it doesn't make sense to to say that mechanistic data is more important than high level research because mechanistic data doesn't have statistical power and it doesn't have generalizability and, and uh, mechanisms can can always be wrong you you think a mechanism may work a certain way but there could be variables that you're not seeing uh, and and that's again I've said this before but that's born out of the fact that a mechanism, when you take it from the lab bench to, you know, hundreds of thousands of people clinically, uh, sometimes it doesn't play out. You think a mechanism should work a certain way, and then when you actually research it, you find, oh, no, there's no no difference or there's the opposite relationship that we expected. So um, that, that's, I guess, my, my overall point. Uh, does the and while Rudolph's looking for that, does anybody have any questions about that? I just wanted to clarify this point. Uh, I posted it in general. Oh, okay. Actually, I have a quick question. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, we all we all know uh, Garth Davis's like general position. It didn't sound like he was making any bold claims in this like debate, or I mean, I guess just like chat with, with Bart. Um, why do you think he didn't like make a strong stance? Was it just to appear agreeable or cause I mean, like I, I'm just, I just had flashbacks to, uh, I guess like the Joe Rogan, uh, Chris Kresser debate and like, just, just without, with uh, and making a strong case, like I'm, I'm not sure what his goal is. Like, do, do you have any suspicions about his his tactics? Like, is he going to come back with something really strong, or is he just trying to remain neutral to like really consider the arguments like being put forth? Because there might be something out of like left field that that Bart has. Yeah, um, I <clears throat> I think that. There's there's many reasons why he had that approach. Um, one of them is I think he just wants. I mean, one thing is he wants it to be a more collegial discussion rather than you know yelling at each other and throwing at each other, which I think is great. You know, I really liked that they had both of them had a friendly tone. That's that's what I really uh, expect uh, in in a discussion with professionals, right? Rather than swearing things like that. So. I think one thing is he didn't want it to go off the rails, and I think Bart didn't want it to go off the rails either. So I give respect to both of them for that, for, for keeping it uh, very collegial. Um, I think one other thing is he was kind of a bit off, taken taken a bit taken back a bit by Bart's approach with respect to mechanism. I think he was Bart was mentioning a few. I, I don't remember exactly what it was, but there's a few things Bart was mentioning mechanistically, which I don't think he was aware of. So he was a bit slightly confused by the mechanism uh and, and that's not a criticism against him i mean we can't all know everything but he was just trying to kind of you know figure out what bart was even talking about um so and then then there's just not enough time either to really dig deep into it they were just doing it for i think half an hour so and that's why he said he wanted to have another section where he would come back uh, to it. So I think it's a it's a combination of those things. I think it's quite different than Joel's uh, or sorry, Dr. Khan's uh, discussion, uh, where Dr. Khan was going hard uh, at Chris on many points, but he he was he was making the 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 fatal mistake of not uh, respecting the evidence hierarchy and trying to dive too much into mechanism. And it's funny because actually Chris was the one that was using the evidence hierarchy to, to, to beat uh, Dr. Khan in that debate. And I, and I think Chris, Chris did a better job in that debate because he stuck to the evidence hierarchy. So if, if, if Dr. Khan really stuck to it, um, you know, it would have been much more, um, a much, much better debate. Um, te if you guys haven't uh, listened to uh, Richard's third debate with Frank, uh, you know, it, it's long, but, you know, just, just listen to it, like, while you're, you know, 
commuting or whatever you're doing because it's, it's a really amazing. Uh, Richard did a, an incredible job. Um, the, the points that he brought up, there it was just masterfully done, and he's such a good debater. So, um, yeah, he, he would have been I – would, I would love to see him versus Chris. They, they, I think it would be much, much, a much better debate. So what's the alternative to mechanisms? Why do you want to hear me talk so bad? Yo. Sorry, Rudolph, what'd you say? What's the alternative to mechanisms? If you, if I heard, if I understood you correctly, you were saying you was kind of attacking this idea of um, science finding, looking for mechanisms. Oh uh, yeah, so so when you when you approach a medical uh, like any medical topic, when you're debating a medical topic, uh, always start with the best evidence you have, right? So the analogy I make uh, is when you when you talk like I guess you're you're a carnist, right? There we go. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, like, if we were, and I'm not debating you on this, but anybody else can. But if we were debating about veganism, about the either the health benefits or, or you know, that kind of thing about veganism, then I, I or, or okay, sorry, not the health benefits. Let's say the moral benefit or the moral argument of veganism, right? If we we're debating that, one tactic that carnists often use is they go to things like, oh, uh, starfish and jellyfish don't have. Uh, sentience or they have minimal sentience so it's okay to eat them they can't feel pain and then they go right into the kind of pseudo gray areas where while while totally ignoring the obvious things like cows pigs things like that so by going into mechanism and not starting with higher level studies you're doing really the same thing you're, you're going into kind of into the weeds and you don't need to because you have a lot stronger evidence that's just sitting there why not why not use your best weapon first and hash things out with your be best weapon? And if that's somehow defeated or, or wrong, then you can regress down the, the hierarchy to, to evidence that's not as strong. And if, if the totality of evidence that they have is stronger as they proceed down the hierarchy, then that's fine. Then maybe you have to change your hypothesis or your viewpoint. But you know, it, to me, it makes no sense. It, it's almost as if it's almost using. It's almost like using anecdote. Like if I went into a debate and I started by saying, you know, Sally is doing great on a vegan diet. She's so healthy. She's exercising well. That that's not that's not convincing in terms of being statistically well powered and generalizable. I mean, you can find anybody who's doing well on any diet or or any lifestyle. You know, you can find somebody who's doing living a long life and is happy uh, being a chain smoker, right? But when you study thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people, then you realize that smoking does have a negative impact on health. So the, the approach should be to always start with the strongest evidence and then go down the hierarchy. I should just, uh, two things, let's just clarify that I'm a carnist, but carnism is morally indefensible. Um, right. And I'm not going to be a carnist when I have the ability to not be a carnist. Uh, but second point is, um, yeah, you're talking about starting with high level studies. It, it, it's strange to me because to, it seems that they supervene on mechanistic studies and mechanistic explanations for things in that uh, they're literally comprised of analyses of mechanistic studies and kind of very particular things, unless you're, uh, unless it's like literally just some kind of correlation thing going. I, it could be that you're using the word mechanism in a way that's unfamiliar to me, but I'm taking it as not just looking for a correlation, but having a kind of framework, having a, a, a structure that explains causes and explains kind of systems not necessarily just causes but systems that are involved that underlie the correlations um and if that's what you mean by mechanisms then it seems incoherent to reject them given that given that these meta uh, meta analyses literally supervene on them supervene on mechanistic studies themselves no but no but wait a minute so the mech so the the, the meta analyses don't necessarily they're not necessarily dependent on mechanistic explanation so you could you could do a RCT on on various diets and how uh, they impact disease. Uh, so, for example, high cholesterol and heart disease. So there'll be a you correlation. RC... They'll just be Sorry? they'll just be looking for correlations. It wouldn't be kind of looking for the mechanism underlying it. Yeah, I was just asking if what you mean by mechanism. Yeah, yeah, it's, is... it, yeah, right, right. It's not looking for the mechanism underlying it. Absolutely, but but what my point is is that if you and me were having a debate. On, on that topic of cholesterol and heart disease, immediately starting with the mechanism uh, in the debate and, and putting that on the table as convincing evidence doesn't make sense because it's not as strong as high-level data with, with millions of patients, right? 
Because I you agree. Can, we never have direct access to the mechanisms or to any causes ever. Like all we in science, all we ever have are correlations. But we, of course, science is all predicated on inferring mechanisms and inferring actual sure, causes sure. as well. Sure, but, so yeah, but, I completely but, agree. Like but, it's just a hypothesis. All mechanisms. But, no, but, are... but, but Rudolph, my point is, is that you don't need to 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 ascertain a strong correlation. You don't need mechanistic speculation. Definitely. Mechanistic speculation can inform uh, where you go with your research grant and which direction you go with your RCT that you perform. But it's not necessary. You could you could say that you know I wonder if people with pink shirts uh, live longer on average and do an RCT on that or or or, or a cohort study or whatever it is, right? Like you you don't need mechanistic uh, information to do uh, epidemiological studies uh, to do RCTs and things like that. It, oftentimes in science, actually, it goes it really goes both ways. But oftentimes in science, the the higher level studies are, are sometimes performed. And then, they, then retrospectively, when the findings are, are found, when things are found, you kind of go back and try to explain them, right? And you go back and try to say, okay, let's, we don't understand this. And then, and then you do kind of mechanistic research just for the satisfaction of knowing how things work. And, and also, the, the value of mechanism is it guides future science, right? So if you understand a certain mechanistic pathway, then you could potentially, uh, you know, design a new treatment that attacks that pathway, right? So, uh, and and this is a thing that a lot of people, uh, you know, uh, misunderstand about my position uh, when they listen to my debate, especially the Carnus, is that they think that I think mechanism is totally useless. And they say that, oh, yeah, my doctor doesn't know how anything works, and, and that's fine. No, no, I'm not saying that at all. And, and Rudolph, I'm not saying that you think this. I know you don't, but a lot, lot of people do. That's why I just want to clarify that that mechanism is super important because it allows us to understand what the heck's going on. Uh, it's important from, I, from my personal, in my personal practice, it's extremely important because I, I try to explain the mechanisms underlying disease to all my patients. So, and, and, it, and that way I don't have to memorize things. It makes me more, a, a more effective practitioner. So I think mechanisms is so important for uh, medical practice and also informing future research. Because if you know what a pathway you know, it's a, this, the, the big thing lately is, is signal transduction, especially in cancer, right? Now, now that we're, we're more getting more savvy with various signal transduction pathways, we're, we're designing very targeted drugs that knock out a certain protein kinase or, or bind into, uh, you know, a certain receptor site competitively uh, and, and block proliferation of cells versus our conventional chemotherapies, which are just like machine guns that just blow up all fast dividing cells, right? So mechanism is ultra, ultra important. And I'm not, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying it's not valuable, but in a discussion and you're trying to try to debate, debate or discuss a certain topic. So always start from your highest level, strongest evidence. Don't go to the bottom. Don't go to the jellyfish. Start at the cow. You know, that's where you should start. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I, I think there's kind of two types of um, scientific enterprise in this sense. You you kind of touched on this, but it really depends on what we're trying to do. So in, in medical research, like obviously if kind of uh, a, a lot of our goals is to try to kind of help people be healthier and help then then all I need is to say X is correlated with Y, so don't eat X or whatever. Um, but then like I'm, I'm seeing a kind of parallel with kind of the sciences of the mind where you have in psychology, there's a lot of kind of these these correlations that go on, and like don't don't beat the shit out of your kid because they'll be depressed later in life and so on. And they even kind of invent mechanisms in air quotes. Um, but psychological mechanisms are often very different to the kind of mechanisms that cognitive scientists, for instance, and neuroscientists will be interested in. Where uh, any kind of correlations are really there to serve as evidence for certain mechanistic frameworks and mechanistic explanations of actual kind of structures that are going on that are causing these at, at the higher levels that are causing these psychological issues. Um, with medicine, I guess maybe the, the analogy would be biology. I don't, I wouldn't really, I, I don't see as many biologists being as content with, with uh, not needing a mechanistic explanation. And I completely agree that uh, when it comes to people saying it's like, oh, we don't understand the mind at all. Well, I, and, and we don't understand X at all. We don't understand Y at all. I, I don't know. Like, uh, we understand stuff about it. We understand stuff about its relationship with other things. We don't necessarily understand at the most reductive level what's going on. And at the end of the day, I think all mechanisms 
really truly all true mechanisms are going to be taking place at that reductive level um but yeah like i think some scientists are all about uh the mechanistic explanations that's all they want to do is all they want to do is figure out what's actually going on and um but then if we're going to but then when we look at it on a broader level we can kind of sit back and, and use words like scientific paradigm and uh or, or scientific framework and they're well and good uh as long as we don't kind of lose sight of the fact that Dr. Peter, we're, really, again. we're really trying to explain what's going on we're not we're not necessarily constructing a framework that makes all the correlations cohere together and makes everything seem to make sense in our heads we're really trying to explain something about the Sorry, you cut off at the end there. Really trying to explain what? Something about the world. The right. Th these paradigms, these frameworks. Right, right. Uh, the only thing I'll say to what you said, which, yeah, and, and everything you said, I, I think I t definitely agree with, is that science, scientists, including, you know, you mentioned biologists, biologists, physiologists, uh, uh, clinical researchers, everybody, all these scientists, I shouldn't say everybody, but... Uh, uh, a plethora of these scientists are not satisfied with not knowing the mechanism. You're 100% right. Uh, and that's for a number of reasons. One is uh, that they just curious scientific curiosity. They want to know, understand how things work. And number two is they want to be able to exploit the mechanism to uh, further uh, health and longevity, right? As I mentioned in my example. So I think you're totally right that scient scientists would not be satisfied by, by stopping at clinical research and not investigating mechanism and doing massive mechanistic studies and that's why some scientists dedicate their whole life to doing mechanistic studies you know i've i've worked with with phd researchers who do nothing but mechanistic research you know so uh that's that's you know i would say that that's as prevalent as medical research i mean they're they're both in in some senses equal and they and they kind of they kind of have a relationship and work together to further uh, the health of, of, uh, of patients. So, yeah, I, th I think they're extremely important. Um, I guess my point is just more of a, a, a point of dis a point of approach to discussion and, and not to lose sight of the fact of what is, what is more powerful and comports more with reality uh, than another, right? Uh, one, 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 on the one hand, you have something that's very plural and generalizable and on the other hand you have something where it's 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 more of a, a a hypothesis or or research of of a hypothesis a research of the of the the small cogs that are moving and the way they move uh, which can be super important but you when you when you zoom out that's when you get the real picture of how does this re relate to reality right and that's why that's why Pharmaceutical research, I mentioned this before, everybody's getting tired of this probably, but that's why pharmaceutical research in, in, with respect to drug research, drugs are not approved once a mechanism is established. Drugs are only approved when high level studies are done to demonstrate their safety and efficacy, right? So if, if some of my opponents, if, if what they said is true, that mechanism is more important than anything else, if that was the case, then after me mechanism, uh, understanding mechanism of a drug, then they would be immediately dispensed to all patients, but they're not because mechanism doesn't always uh, correlate with reality. Why? Because we oftentimes don't have the, the full picture when it comes to mechanism. So you can start with mechanism, go to higher level studies from that, inform, that informs your higher level studies. Your higher level, level studies may say something different than what we expect. So you go back to the bench and then re try to rework your mechanism. And then that's a cycle. You can just go back and forth and, and then uh, further your understanding of, of a relationship. I, uh, I linked a blog post that you'd probably love uh, by Scott Alexander called Beware the Man of One Study. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. You, you know it, yeah. I, I, think it, it, I think it's the idea of N equals one, if I'm, uh, if I'm not mistaken. But I, I, I'll, I'll definitely read it and take a look at it, yeah. Yeah, I think like the point of kind of epistemic weight is is huge here. Like it's not necessarily, I mean, it it, it is, but it's not always necessarily that um that the meta study is kind of necessarily accessing reality more or less in in the way. Like I put a study that asks a question that's just as broad as a meta study question. 
but obviously the epistemic weight of one study isn't going to be as strong as, as that of a whole literature or like whatever subset of the literature the meta study takes into account. Um, but yeah, um, so in that way, but on the other hand, there's just straight up epistemic weight. Like I, I talk with a lot of people, um, I've noticed this that sometimes I'll be arguing for some kind of controversial claim. I think, uh, the most recent one I remember was, uh, innate sex differences in cognition between men and women. Um, and the person I was talking to was like taking an individual study and really kind of picking it apart in a way that I'm um, showing how like there's some statistical problems here and here and, um, and that's well and good. Like that's really important to do. But on the other hand, there's a couple of factors that kind of uh, make this problematic when you're using it to provide uh, strong empirical support for your perspective. One of them is an isolated demand for rigor where you would accept a certain level of evidence for any topic, but if it happens to be a, maybe a political topic or a controversial topic, you you demand the kind of you have this isolated demand for rigor because you kind of don't want to accept it. And on the other hand, um, when there's a whole weight of a literature leaning in a certain direction, literally every study is going to have individual problems. That's just it's it's impossible to have a perfect study. Um, so you can pick apart one study in a certain way. If the whole literature is biased in a certain way, that's a big deal. But if every study has errors that are slightly different between studies, then I would still say that the weight of the literature itself is going to strongly lean towards uh, uh, more epistemic authority than otherwise. So uh, when you say weight of the literature, like can you relate that to medical research? So what do you mean by that? Uh, I don't really know much about medical research in particular, but I, I just mean like if, if it so happens that there's like, I don't know, smoking and cancer, you know, there's like 500 studies of, about how smoking is linked to cancer and some of them are just straight up correlation. Some of them kind of propose mechanisms for why and so on. Um, if I'm really against that claim, I can kind of, and, and I'm statistically educated, I can really pick apart individual studies and find problems and find issues involved. Um, but doing that is kind of missing the broader picture that if there's 500 studies uh, that, are, that support this hypothesis that smoking causes cancer, then, and assuming that each one isn't going to have the same problem, because if they all have the same problem, that's kind of, that's flawed. But if they all have like little different niggling statistical errors or little different kind of problems of study design and so on, uh, then the weight of the literature in this sense, I'm just referring to the fact that uh, the, the, the weight of evidence, the, the amount of papers, the amount of studies that support this conclusion uh, still lean heavily in the direction of the hypothesis. And that looking for individual one individual flaw in this paper, one individual flaw in that paper, isn't actually going to be sufficient to disprove the hypothesis. And if I do that, I generally... I'm probably suffering from a need for an isolated demand for rigor because I really don't want to believe that claim. I 100% agree with you, Rudolph. So totally. That makes that makes total sense to me. You you got to look at the totality of the research. Small errors might be here or there, but you look at you know wh which which direction is all the research pointing, right? And if, if you have a totality pointing in a certain direction, um, then then that's something you got to consider, right? And and that's most likely reflects reality. Um, and you know, picking apart little minor things here or there, um, you know, it doesn't 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 do anything to um, deflect the the reality that that uh, that uh, conglomerate is pointing to. So I 100% uh, agree with that. Yeah, there was an interesting um, situation that happened. It might have been a year or two ago, where this very uh, well-known psychologist called Bem published, I think it was seven, pa seven studies at once that uh, showed in the, in parapsychology that showed an effect for phi, uh, phi psi, I don't remember which one, which is basically the, the paranormal phenomenon. There's a whole kind of field of research called parapsychology where they try to study the paranormal. So they have kind of, um, in some, in some cases, like decently done studies where they kind of uh, ask people to guess what shape is behind the card or what thing is in the next room and so on and so forth. And, um, some people who are self-professed mediums and psychics will be able to kind of, uh, do this to a greater extent or, or and other people to a lesser extent. And so a lot of these studies kind of show a positive effect for, I'm going to call it phi. I don't remember the, the word they use, but that's just the kind of, uh, the, that, that paranormal phenomenon. Um, so this guy published kind of these studies, which 
everyone was um they they seemed to at least from what i understand i'm not a scientist i'm a philosopher but at least from what i understand they seem to kind of comport with general scientific standards of rigor and it showed this positive effect and what everyone did was obviously they all kind of started picking apart the study they showed maybe it was like uh data peaking or sample size where you kind of stop sampling people at a certain point once you've reached a statistically significant effect all these kinds of issues um but the conclusion of course it, it's not necessarily that um he was right but that like he was comporting with standard you know scientific uh standards i guess uh and that could possibly be a problem with science itself so there's another uh, blog that i read which actually kind of makes this argument that we should look at parapsychology as uh the control group for science itself if like assuming that kind of there is no paranormal phenomena which i assume i don't know if i'm necessarily justified in doing so but i assume it then i can say any, any kind of audio literature is getting and uh these are and assuming that they kind of have the same standards which isn't necessarily true i guess we can kind of do more rigorous meta studies in that i'm sure people have tried i'm not um yeah if if we do that then we can um see what problems we have in our scientific standards i think there was a recent thing about people coming out against statistical significance i just read it today uh, a whole bunch and there's even some journals that are kind of banning uh the use of p uh p equals 0 0.05 as this uh, uh measure of significance and they want other other measures instead again i'm not a statistician i'm not really sure what that means or i mean how how that would work in terms of a new way to, to measure uh, effect size and significance but yeah i think that uh, it, it really does reveal problems with with um, the scientific with our kind of methodology in particular that's yeah that's pretty interesting and i i can't comment too much because i'm not a statistician either uh in terms of you know whether uh, p is not appropriate anymore and that kind of thing um maybe there is some an evolution that has to happen with uh, analysis of um, data I, I wouldn't be the guy to ask about that, but that's, that's, yeah, that's very fascinating. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think I've made my point. Uh, so I just, uh, before I sign off here, does anybody else have any, any thoughts or questions or anything like that? Um, do you happen to still have the, um, study that Bart sent you, the speci specifically the one by, uh, Ravenskov? Yeah, yeah, I I have that. I mentioned that one. Yeah. So what my plan is for the next videos is, and, and I'm I'm really slow with the videos, so I apologize. But uh, what my plan what I plan on doing is, uh, probably to do the next one to be, um, probably going to do the um the kind of the clinical higher level re evidence connecting cholesterol to heart disease. Then I'll do um a video uh, like going over that uh, uh review and why I disagree with it. Uh, and then uh, I have to go through it. I just went, I've gone through it, gone through it, but I want to really go through it again uh, and, and just to, to tease it apart. But it, it's not well written at all. It's, it's quite bad. Um, it's a lot yeah. of conjecture and opinion. And it's basically, it's basically, uh, uh, they, they kind of talk about data and then they go, well, if the, if the data shows this, then how come this wasn't found? And that's, that's their analysis. Just basically saying, why isn't it like this? Why isn't it like this? Like that's the entire thing. So I, I'll just, I'll go through that. It's it's really uh, very poorly written. Um, so but I'm gonna yeah I'm definitely gonna do a video on that. So yeah, that'll come in. All right. Cool. Um, do you could you just put it up in general because I'm I've, I've been looking at his stuff and I went over it just quickly with a couple of guys in here. Um, and I was actually I started writing up notes. Um. On it, and I was gonna like, cause it, 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 I was gonna actually go through all the references that he's used, and um, essentially to say, well, here's the problem with this, and here's the problem with that. If you're doing it, though, then I'm happy, and I'll, I'll just pass you on the notes that are fine. No, no, I, I, well, no, I think I would appreciate if you did your own video, and you know, then I maybe I won't do it, and I'll just, I'll just refer to your video. I would really appreciate that, uh, because, or I mean, we can both have videos. I think. Because I very much enjoy your your videos and your analysis, so I I, I would not I would not uh, ask you to submit, submit your work to me, and I'd, I'd ask. Yeah, you to the you thing about. is, making videos is a lot of effort for me, so I'm actually pretty happy to let you do the work. Okay, yeah, if you don't want to do it, then, <laughs> then that's fine. Then I'm happy to take your stuff. No, no problem. I appreciate it.
All right, no problem. Um, yeah, if you, whatever you find useful or you're happy to use, use it. If there's things that you don't like or disagree with or um, don't find useful, let me know. And um, yeah, obviously, or you know, just don't use it. Whatever's good for you. No, I I, oh. uh, I definitely appreciate that. Really do. All right, I'll just type up some of the rest of the shit um, as best as I can. And then, oh, um, can you just put the specific one? That he sent you. I'm pretty sure it's the same one that I'm thinking of. Yeah, sure. Uh, hold on. Let me just find it one second. Yeah, I think it's this one here <clears throat> that I posted. Yeah. Um, did he put any other one up, or is it, it was that one? Yeah, I think that was. I think that was the only one that I that I saw. Okay. Um, there's also. Oh, let's see. So this is by the same author. Um, I'll just have to make sure. I'll go over um, Bart stuff and just make sure. Um, but I'm pretty confident he's also put this one up. It's by oh, the same. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I think actually this might be the one. I think the one I found is another one. I think this is the right one. Okay, I'll, I'll might go uh, or um. I think one of the guys in here he knows lots of his work. Or Bart's work pretty well. So between us, maybe we'll just look over which one it was specifically and go over that. Uh, Richard Richard made a, a brilliant point, I think, about this this study actually uh, in the debate with Frank. Uh, I think it was after the one hour mark uh, about uh, uh, reverse causation effect. How uh, I think I think you've mentioned this too. What was your other name again, man? Uh, that you go by on uh, Discord? Didn't you change your name? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what was I don't know what I was at. The... Okay, okay, okay. That's, okay, that's, that's fine. That's fine. But. But what, 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 like, what, what, is there a common name I can, or a name I can reference you by? Uh, yeah, just, um, Cogdis is fine, or Cog, or whatever. Yeah, uh, if you, yeah. I'm sorry, uh, what, what was it again? I'll type that out. Okay, okay, thanks. But, um, yeah, about the reverse causation effect, about how, um, disease in, uh, elderly, uh, various diseases, including heart disease and, and other diseases, can sometimes lead to actually lower levels of cholesterol. I would I would extend for that or infer from that uh, also um, uh, potentially poor oral intake with chronic disease. All of these things can actually cause a lowering of, of cholesterol levels, um, and so that could be uh, that could explain why there's this association of um, of um, LDL not causing heart disease or not being so positively associated in elderly. So, yeah, the way he he talked about that was just brilliant. I, I'm only halfway through the debate, so I got to keep going. But it's it's really uh, an awesome, it's really fun debate. And by uh, about a minute thirty thirty five, um, it, gets, it gets really fun. But yeah, sorry, what were you saying? No, it's, it's uh... oh cog. Okay, so, got it. Yeah, so the there's a bit of a um i've noticed there's a bit of a red herring where they do a switch of a couple of things um so they they switch uh all cause mortality with um with the cardiac results um and they use that interchangeably which is that's that's the red herring uh, i've found uh, so far yeah. so the one the one that they that you put up so it's like a risk an association or an inverse association between ldl and mortality in the elderly so that's an all-cause mortality right. so that's not a cardiac mortality right right whereas uh the one that i put up which is the um his i think it's his second most recent one um that one is it's if it loads for me yeah here we go uh ldl um does not cause cardiovascular disease so they and this is the thing is they do a bit of a bait and switch with this so they um 
So yeah, it, it could be. A bit, it's a bit of a equivocation. The uh, cold poison put up in general, it's a equivocation. So it's a bit of a, an equivocation. Sometimes it's a red herring, depending on um, where you get into the conversations. So they'll throw it out as a red herring as well. So, um, but you don't. Um, it, it's something that you have to sort of catch. But uh, so they they will. Um, so the one that you put up. The inverse association for all cause mortality, that's correct. So what you said is correct. So as people get older, um, what you generally tend to find is they'll have, even if they have an, an acute illness like um, just a UTI or some shit like that, they that can cause a decrease in all um, cholesterol levels. And it can actually even make um, HDL atherosclerotic. Um, right. And so as old people, you know, well, people as they get older, they just get sick more frequently. Right. Um, you know that you would know that from your clinical experience. Yeah. Um, and that causes an acute drop of their LDL. Right. And right. So what you find is, as people you know get sick and die, they generally tend to have lower um, lower total cholesterol levels, right. um, which which is different to the. Because uh, they're not necessarily dying due to cardiovascular uh, reasons. Right, right. They might be dying due to, you know, quite often, just infections or some other issue. Often infections. Um, and that's the equivocation that they do, or the red herring, is they, they'll equivocate between all cause and cardiovascular disease um, and just do a bit of a bait and switch. Um, so even the one that I put up, um, he he talks about LDL and cardiovascular disease, but it, as you get sort of like a bit further down, he starts talking about all-cause mortality, and he says, well, here's, the, here's a few studies that show that um, all-cause mortality um, is inversely uh, correlated with um, with uh, total cholesterol, which is it's a redundant point because his entire study, the one that I put up, it's only it's only supposed to be addressing LDL. Yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. Nothing, nothing to do with all cause mortality, and yeah. that's this little band and switch that is done. Um, so yeah, so what what you're saying and what Richard was saying is correct, and I think Avi pointed out before he left, he's the one because I had trouble figuring out and understanding what the fuck was going on, and he pointed out to um, Richard and he told me as well that the all cause mortality due to or correlated with cholesterol that's an unknown thing in the um medical field due to um acute illnesses and shit like that but that's yeah a bait and switch but yeah, I'll, I'll um i'll type that up and send it through to you yeah i appreciate it cog and uh yeah the um yeah that effect is the the that the, the notion of that uh the illness being correlated with the drops in cholesterol is very interesting and also the, um, as you said, like there's there's a whole bunch of discussion here, uh, either either switching between CBD and all cause mortality, and also um, you know uh, discussion about total cholesterol, you know, which that's not what we're claiming. We're not claim we're not discussing uh, total cholesterol because obviously HDL is a fraction of total cholesterol, and and in the case of uh, non, uh, 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 in case of healthy patients at least uh, or relatively healthy patients. Uh, HDL will be anti-atherogenic. So, uh, to to discuss total cholesterol, it's it's you just he's just kind of wasting time. Uh, so yeah, I, I'm gonna focus when I talk about his talk. I'm gonna try to focus on uh, the LDL sections and talk about this effect, and uh, yeah, go through everything. Uh, but I thought first uh, I would do a review of the of the European Heart Journal study and. Uh, and I'll just see if there's any other studies I want to touch on. But that's the main thing I'm going to base everything on because I think it's probably the strongest, uh, one of the strongest uh, modern studies we have connecting LDL to uh, cardiovascular disease. Um, I'll just put this up. Um... I'll just show you something. I think this, I just did a quick look for something I've, I thought was there, but yeah. So this one um, sort of discusses LDL drops and HDL mm -hmm. uh, change. Um, so HDL drops, but it, it also has a change as well and cholesterol, uh, LDL levels um, 
was also dropped as well. Um, whereas Prigs might increase and BLDL might um, increase. Um, so that's sort of along those lines. I think there's mm -hmm. an, another one which is a bit better, but I'll look for it and put up uh, when I send the shit through to you. All right. Okay, uh, so I'm going to just sign off now. Um, anybody else? Any thoughts or questions or anything? All right, guys. Uh, appreciate uh, the discussion. Good chat. Uh, yeah, R R Rudolph, uh, appreciate uh, the discussion. It was uh, great. Very uh, uh, impressed with your uh, knowledge. I uh, appreciate it very much. Uh, and cold poison, thank you very much. And uh, yeah, I think uh, I might. Um, uh, yeah, uh, th uh, thanks, Isaac. Thanks a lot. Uh, I might do a. Um, if you guys want, like either a weekly or monthly kind of talk on the weekend, uh, like Friday or Saturday or something like that, where we just kind of uh, go over medical topics and studies and news and stuff like that. And then you guys can ask questions and stuff like that. Uh, obviously, it won't be any, um, you know, direct uh, advice uh, to you um, specifically for your own health. It would just be speaking in general terms. Um, so if you guys want to do something like that, then definitely uh, I think that would be a, that'd be a fun thing to do. And uh, yeah, we, we could do it a few times and just see if there's any value in it. If there's no value, then I could stop it. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, I'm going to start hopefully uh working on my next video but uh yeah i'm just uh, just so slow because i'm just doing so many just too many things uh, going on <laughs> uh so that's what makes it a bit more challenging um uh the next topic will be um the so i did mechanisms for the first talk, uh, talk so the second talk will be um uh, like i guess clinical research or evidence or high level evidence uh, I don't know what I'm, how I'm going to frame it, but basically going going to the top of the hi uh, hierarchy and then actually really I'm going to just really focus on that uh, meta-analysis from the European Heart Journal, uh, but I'll look at um, other things too. And then now that the um, mechanism video is out there, you know, I'll refer to, uh, you know, various medical terms and cholesterol and LDL, and I'll say small DLDL and all this, I'll say all these terms. And then of course, uh, I could just easily refer to my prior video. So that's, that's the nice thing about that video being uh, done, you know? Um, and uh, I think the one that, you know, I, I, I also want to have, I mean, all the stuff I'm talking about is obviously all over the internet. Anybody can read it, but I think the way I'm delivering it, I'm trying to make that unique. So, because I just I want my content to be somewhat useful to you guys rather than just rehashing what's already out there. So the way I'm delivering it, uh, hopefully, is is helpful. And I don't I didn't see that many uh, long talks uh, that are in depth on mechanism on YouTube. I found kind of shorter talks that are kind of more uh, kind of gloss over the details. So hopefully my content is a little bit unique and, and helpful um, because I don't want to just rehash things and just be another, you know, to just have the same stuff. So, um, but yeah, anyways. Uh, okay. So thanks a lot guys. Uh, yeah. And if you get a chance, definitely check out uh, and Isaac, you too, man, check out uh, Richard's third video, man. It's that debate is just epic. It's uh, I'm halfway through. I'm going to keep uh, watching it now. It's just amazing. Um, just quickly, what uh, debate are you talking about? Sorry. Oh, the um, the um, uh, here I'm going to post it in general. Hold on a second. Hey, uh, what's your uh, YouTube name? I, I'm assuming you upload videos on YouTube. Oh uh, yeah, it's it yeah. He he put it up there. It's uh, tactical medicine. I just only I only have I only have one content video. 
so far. Yeah, my my channel is not going to be super active. It'll be pretty slow. So I. Uh, okay, one second. Okay, here's the. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, the cog. yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's really yeah. That, that's the one. Uh, it has the time. I think I put a timestamp in it, so just so you know, in case you want to go to that okay. fun section. But yeah, it's it's a really good, uh, really good debate. And now now he's playing. And also, uh, Isaac did a video too uh, on um, vegan foot soldiers. So I gotta watch that. I didn't get a chance to watch that. Uh, um, also, uh, you know, you can link like you know in your user info, you can link all your um, stuff like your YouTube. So you can just link that in uh, onto your user info and sync those two. Oh yeah, uh, Isaac mentioned that. I haven't done that yet. Uh, hold on a second. I, I right click in profile. Uh, actually, uh, I don't know if Isaac can run you through it or someone. Oh, okay. I did my ages because I can't remember off the top of my head. Okay. Uh, it's user. Okay, user settings. Okay. I'll uh, try to do that. And. Um, yeah, and Isaac. Uh, yeah, I, I'll I'll uh, touch on the. I should touch on the Bradford Hill. Uh, if not, I'll touch on it in the third. Um, I'll probably I'll probably talk about it uh, in the second video, and then go into more depth in the third video. So the second video uh, will focus on the European Heart Journal article, and it, that article actually satisfies all the Bradford Hill criteria. So that that study actually does. If you go by that definition. The satisfying the criteria proves causality, then it does prove prove causality. Um, uh, okay, is me yeah mechanism mechanistic data uh, necessary? So this is, I know this was in the debate with uh, Richard and Frank. Uh, so I guess technically it is a criteria. the 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 wording is a bit weird if you read the wording about how um, it's helpful but limited by current knowledge. So it's kind of, I would say it's a criteria, but a weak criteria. And I think I agree with uh, Richard that you can prove causation without uh, knowing the exact precise mechanism. I, I think that's probably correct. But obviously if you have the mechanism as well, then um, it, that's stronger. But in the case of uh, cholesterol and heart disease, I mean, that's not even a, you know, a, a point of discussion and just refer to my last video. You know, we clearly have mechanistic information and data of how LDL can cause uh, heart disease. Um, and I think actually a lot of people who claim it doesn't actually don't even disagree. It, their, their point of disagreement is, is kind of a subtle one. It's not a, it's not an obvious one. So. The, the people that we've talked to in the past who disagree are not saying that LDL has absolutely no role or doesn't do doesn't have any connection to heart disease. What they're saying is LDL in its natural state, unmodified, is not a risk factor. But once it becomes modified, then it is a risk. They agree, oftentimes agree, it is a risk factor. So their 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 strategy for for minimizing disease is basically to reduce. Uh, the modifying effects. So uh, being unhealthy, being obese, sedentary, smoking, all these things can increase levels of oxidation and, and uh, ages and all the stuff I've talked in, uh, you know, the advanced like uh, the constellation end products and all that stuff. And it can modify the LDL and then make it more atherogenic. So what their point is, is reduce all those things so that LDL is not atherogenic and then you have no problem. Then you can eat as much cholesterol as you want. Now, my counter to that, or my, my issue is, I, first of all, I agree with reducing uh, modification factors as much as possible. You definitely do that. But mo reduce the amount of, of the bombs as well, right? So, so I'm, not, I'm not implying that LDL is, is, is completely toxic. I'm not implying that. But what I'm saying is, is that if you reduce the level of LDL that, that, is, that is in the body, and certainly don't eat dietary LDL because you don't dietary cholesterol because you don't need it because your liver synthesizes it. Then you're reducing the ammunition that you have for the body to use to do damage, right? So that's why when you have very very low LDL, you generally don't have any heart disease because you don't have the ammunition. Even if you have a modifying ability, which all of us do, 
it's not that we can do some kind of magic we don't have any modifying ability because we all have rest cellular respiration we all have electron transport we all have free radicals we all have that we can reduce it but we all have it so reduce the amount of ldl that can be modified by the body right reduce the the modifying effects have a healthy lifestyle don't smoke don't drink uh, be a healthy body weight exercise but also reduce the cholesterol too. And if you do both, you'll have the best outcome, right? So I think that's kind of where I stand in kind of the both sides of the debate where on one side, we're saying reduce the cholesterol. Other side, they're saying reduce the inflammatory effects that can modify cholesterol. Um, so yeah, I think I'm rambling now, sorry. Uh, let's see, Karnas debate technically again help seems to uh... yeah i mean uh, isaac see the thing is is in in science and in research everything is a, is really not everything but you know things are generally are often a spectrum right where it's you have a certain level of, of uh, confidence in something uh and so if you have research that satisfies many, many of the Bradford Hill criteria, but doesn't satisfy every single one, then you could say, okay, according to the BH criteria, we have not proven causality, fine. But if you've satisfied many of them, then you're going to say that, you know, I'm pretty confident that this is the cause of the disease, right? Now, in the case of this discussion, it, it's, it's, uh, it, it absolutely is because we satisfied all the criteria. If you look in the European Heart Journal, I'll show you here. They've satisfied it. Hold on. One second, sorry. So here's the study again, and then there's a table I'll post. Here, Isaac, look at this table. I've literally got it in there. Yeah, it's in there. It's right there. It's in here. If you don't shut up, I'm going to shoot everything. So, I think, did they put plausibility? Let's see. Yeah, plausibility is the first one. So, yeah, they have everything there. So, I mean, it... Uh, even by, if you're going by the... Uh, saying that, that you need to satisfy the BH criteria while well, they've satisfied it. it now, they may, to, yeah. they may argue on individual points that... More tangible. They may, they may go on individual points where it's not hey. satisfied, hey, but you. of course that discussion can hey, happen. Hey, 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 you. Hey, this is Paul Polka. What are you doing, man? Hey, how are you? Yeah, what's up? From populous Michael. I like. What? Is Can you just mute yourself? Yeah, sorry. Could you just mute yourself? We're just in the middle of something. Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll mute myself here. Yeah. Sorry, man. Just I'll finish your point. No, no, I, I'm I'm done now. I, all I was saying was that the the table is right there, so you can look at it and it has very lots of references. And um, I'm I'm gonna just go through this in uh, the discussion and. I'll go through the Mendelian stuff. I'll go through uh, PCSK9 stuff and go through all of that stuff. And I'll, I'll try to do like a long, like in-depth talk like I did before and just put it together. And uh, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what that guy was doing. <laughs> all right.
right, guys. Well, thanks a lot for the discussion, and I will catch you guys later. Maybe uh, next week uh, we can talk more. Uh, if you guys have any ideas for topics or things you want to discuss next week, uh, just uh, maybe uh, message me, uh, and then we can um, make kind of a list. And then I don't want to do a super long talk because uh, everybody gets bored then, maybe like half an hour or one hour or something like that, and then we just uh, discuss some points, and then that's it. Cool. If you can do this at least like once a month, allowing, obviously, like, if your um, schedule allows, then that would be good. I think that'd be I, great for. I I think I think I should be able to do it once a week. I think if if there's a demand for it, I, obviously I, I don't want to like push myself onto people, um, because that's that's annoying. But uh, if if people actually want it, then I think I should be able to do it once a week. Um, so yeah, I like we're all com we're all communists here, man. Don't um, we don't believe in the supply and demand stuff. That's <laughs> capitalist bullshit. <laughs> All right, guys. Okay, take care, everyone. Have a good night, sir. All right, take care. Right.